G'day folks, it's Dan here from Evagility, here today to talk to you about our continuing series on Kanban practices. And the practice we're going to focus in on today is uh, managing flow. Now, managing flow is a really interesting concept whereby we want to make sure that our workflow is optimised for, for being fit for purpose. Um, now, in our, our case, our example is the creation of, of, of beer here. That's the uh, service we, we want to uh, check out. And this is actually the end point here when it gets into the kegs and into the kegerator. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you for a bit of a tour around the brewery today um, just so that you can have a look at what are the steps in the process, where's the bottleneck, you know, where's the commit point, um, you know, what sort of lead times we can expect and, and how we manage flow across that system. So here we have our beer making process and you can see there's a number of steps in this overall process. So we start really from the left hand side and recipe which is just to the left of the commit point uh, before we start the preparation and, and making the wort. Okay? And then later on we go on to fermentation and conditioning and then eventually delivery of the beer. Now here we have our uh, recipe and you can see at this point we haven't really committed to the uh, making of the beer. We can, we can play around with the recipe, adjust it as we like. We can um, change the settings and, and do anything we like, but it's not really until we start the preparation that we can really have the commit point there um, because at that point we've expended, um, we're starting to expend some time and money in making of the beer. To the right of the commit point, we start the preparation of making the beer, which is about crushing the grain and preparing the wort. Okay, and then we next see uh, making of the wort where we've mixed the grain in with the, the water and started to heat it up and boil it. Once we've made our wort, we move on to the fermentation process and there are two options for doing the fermentation in our process. We have the first option where we can do it in a refrigerator in either one or two vessels. Um, or we have the option of doing it in the what we call the Harry Potter cupboard, which I'll show you in a moment. Now here we are with the fermentation fridge and you can see it in its single fermenter configuration. Now as you can see, I can only ferment one beer in this fridge as it currently stands. Now using the fridge in this method is really useful for our hoppy ales or perhaps our lagers uh, with the two vessel system. So either way, you know, they work better in this particular fridge. So let's check out the two vessel configuration. As you can see, as I open the fridge, it's currently configured to hold two fermentation vessels. Now this will allow us to get through two beers or two little kegs into our kegerator uh, through one ferment. They have to be fermented at the same temperature and range with the same type of beer, um, but that's okay if we're doing a double batch. This is one of the key bottlenecks in our system. We only have either one or two fermentation uh, vessels for our lagers, and that can usually take a couple of weeks. The other potential bottleneck is the conditioning fridge. Now, the lagers in the conditioning fridge can be there for anywhere between two and six weeks, depending upon our patients and the quality that we're looking for, um, potentially even up to 12 weeks. So that could be a fairly considerable bottleneck uh, before getting things ready to serve. So let's look at an alternative situation where we can do some more fermentation and not have such a bottleneck. <sighs> And here we have what I call the Harry Potter cupboard, uh, conveniently located under the stairs. It keeps a nice constant temperature and uh, as you can see, we can get some fermenters in under there. The maximum is about three fermenters that I can get in here to ferment our beer. So here you can see our overall workflow and you can see that there are different work item types taking different paths through the workflow. You can also see different whip limits being applied to those different work item types and we can see our uh, commit and delivery points that's going to sort of impact and show where our lead times start and finish. So we've got different aspects of the Kanban system through that flow and we need to manage that carefully. 
Otherwise, as my uncle would say, if we didn't replace the Heinekens we took from the fridge, then we have problem. Mm -hmm.